very much. Thank you. Um, those, anybody who knows the original Fragonard picture from this, which this is taken, will know that in the 18th century original, she wasn't holding an Ivo dog, and she was in colour, but hey, <laughs> you get the point. It, it, it was a nice little Pekingese sitting there in her arms. Yeah, okay. um, I've got a slight dilemma as to um, thinking I might have, in some sense, two different sorts of audience. I, I know there's a fusion going on here in Harvard, um, uh, both a computer science audience, some of whom will know a about, lot about natural language processing, and a more socially orientated audience. But since I'm going over to the Berkman Institute after this, I thought I'd today, this talk now has more of the, uh, the NLP aspects, although we get to some general questions at the end, I promise. Um, the, uh, the quote there at the top says that some Frenchman quite a while ago said that, not recently. And I thought I'd give the talk a bit of class by uh, quoting a Harvard man there, T.S. Eliot, the, the, uh, the relevance of the... Can you read that? From a, is that read legible? Okay. Um, the quote will become uh, relevant later when we talk about old people and photographs. I'm, as you might imagine, interested in the first of those and to some degree interested in the second as you'll see where the application develops. The talk... I'll, I'll talk to you about this large EU... EC... Sorry... Uh, uh, project which they funded about three years ago for a lot of money. Um, it's had a kind of up and down career. I wrote the proposal and ran it for the first uh, two and a half years. I've stopped running it now. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm running some other part of it. Um, but I'll describe to you the senior companion prototype for which I was responsible. And there's some, I think, some reasonably original-ish. It wouldn't pass the Lobner competition, I can tell you. But nevertheless, I think it has some reasonably interesting technical features that I'll, I'll mention. Um, the the thing about moving from performance to theory, there is indeed a direct joke about the Lovner competition, as you'll see, and we'll mention that later. Um, I see what we've done as, as no more than, I mean, the demos are on the web. I'll show you no movies, I'll show you no demos, but they're on the web, and I'll give you the web address, and you can look there for yourself and see what you think about it if you want to. Um, but I see what we've done so far as being more a platform for uh, machine learning experiments. Many of the structures inside it have not been learned, some have, Many have not been, and the plan for the rest of the Companions Project in Europe was to try and learn the structures that we've developed. Now, that's not totally coming out right, but often in machine learning it doesn't, but I'll say something about that. I'll then get to some social issues. Uh, the Sheet Dialogue's been kind of the Cinderella of NLP in some ways. It's been around a very long time, not, not like Cinderella. Um, she was young, of course. This is old, but it, it's somehow not developed in the way that, say, even machine translation has, let alone exciting bits in to do with information extraction and syntactic processing. Part of the reason for that has been the difficulty of getting large corpora. Um, there are large dialogue corpora, but they tend to be things like phone records. They don't tend to be in the domain you want, and everybody in NLP now knows that being in the domain you want is rather important for data. So it's been quite difficult to get the sort of data. We've got some data for this project, and I'll, I'll not say anything about that. Also, there's another problem with dialogue processing. Um, there's not a well-established evaluation regime for it, as there is for information extraction, machine translation and lots of other parts of NLP that DARPA had stimulated because uh, evaluation regimes came with the DARPA sponsorship. It, it can also be very vacuous. I mean, you know, you can still open textbooks in sociolinguistics that tell you dialogues are systems of turn-taking. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, can be, it can be grim. But that thing, that is progress, I believe, has been made. Um, the trouble is a lot of the aspects of machine dialogue processing dialogue between humans and computers, um, still has a lot of the flavor of where it started. It's been going a long time. I say it's not new. Um, it was there right at the beginning of NLP, really. Um, back in the 70s, there was Parry in Stanford, which was a very, very good system, very robust, never broke down, never spewed lisp code at you. And there's always been this division between two kinds of approach. Um, smaller systems, of which Terry Winograd's at MIT was the most famous in 1970, which concentrated on a very tiny domain that they mapped with a firm knowledge base and understood totally, with a firm representation, but weren't much fun. I mean, um, you wouldn't want to take that dialogue system to a desert island with you, great though it was. Um, Parry, on the other hand, a paranoid dialogue system from Stanford of the same period, was much more fun than Desert Island. It could amuse you sometimes, it could bore you, but it, it, it kept talking. I mean, it, it told you crazy stuff about horses and Italian-Americans and all kinds of stuff. So there were wide, shallow systems that, in some sense, knew nothing, and narrow, deep systems that knew quite a lot. And... Uh, publications in AI, in dialogue theory, have all tended to be in the first group, for perfectly good reason. It, it's hard to say interesting theoretical things about the latter, which we now dismiss them chiefly as chatbots. Oops, sorry. Oh, wait a minute, it's ceased to love me here. What's going on? Have I? Whoa, I'm not pushing the right button. I was. Yeah. Okay, so I, um, 
I was at the University of Sheffield from, since I went back from the States in 1993, uh, created an NLP group there, and I got into the dialogue about 1997 when a friend of mine in London called David Levy paid my team some money because he wanted to win the Lobner Prize. And uh, we thought that'd be fun. I knew nothing about the Lobner competition, had no views on it, only all views I have have come from Stu's famous paper. And uh, uh, we just thought, oh, this would be a challenge, get some consultancy into the students' pockets. And uh, we got together a team and we won it for him. I mean, David Levy took the prize. The prize money isn't very great. It didn't in any way cover his costs, which were enormous. Um, and but it, it got me interested in dialogue and taught me quite a bit about it. Um, I think the present state of play is, and this includes what I'm talking about now. We've got four major competing approaches in human dialogue processing. Um, there's simple hand-coded finite state systems in Vox XML, which is the standard low-level language for writing in. And most of the chatbots you get on the web are either written in that or something equivalent to that. There's some very strong-minded, theoretically motivated logic-based systems. Trindy is the best known in Europe, um, based on paradigms like information state updates. They are part of the good old solid body of AI of strong logic representations. A third is in some way the most interesting. It's the extension into dialogue processing of the speech guys. Uh, in European terms, that means people like Steve Young at Cambridge. But you can find analog to him here. Um, they've done very well. I mean, um, Fred Jelinek used to hold this view at Johns Hopkins. I'm not sure he does anymore. These are people who've done very well with speech engineering, and they think that linguistics is basically rubbish, and dialogue processing shouldn't be left to linguists and NLP people, who they think haven't been very good at it. Why can't the speech people reproduce their success? They're very strong, wide machine learning methods. Um, they use words like Dirichlet process these days, and POMDPs. Why can't they extend those methods into dialogue and wrap the whole thing up, not just the speech front end, which is NLP people tend to see speech at the front end, and the real stuff's going on in the NLP. Speech people don't see it that way. Steve Young has been a very strong advocate, and uh, as a man who sold his company to Microsoft for a huge amount of money, so he carries all the authority that that means. That's a joke, by the way. Um, he did do a very, very good speech learning system. Uh, the trouble is that hasn't yet really paid off. I thought it was much more of a threat three or four years ago. They haven't got there yet, but they remain the most strongly theoretically motivated and in some ways determined people to sort this out there where they're engineers. Okay, they've no, they've no prejudices in linguistics or logic. They don't care about that stuff. We shall see. I don't believe... Um, Steve Pullman at Oxford is still basically believes that stuff, although he, he's a linguist who's been converted to those beliefs, and he still believes that. I don't. The fourth, I think, is what the Companions, process, the companions Project sort of represents, what I would call a rational hybrid, a hybrid of symbolic and um, quantitative methods, hoping to bring in machine learning wherever we can, but uh, making it work, but also with a strong emphasis on performance, in no way like the Trinity system, whose basically as his emphasis has been on theoretical views and theoretical clarity rather than on performance. The emphasis in Companions has been performance. In that sense, it owes something to chatbots. It's really just another kind of computer interface. I mean, I say this really just because I want to show you this picture if you've never seen it before. Has anyone seen this picture before? It's a very famous picture. Of course you have. This is the famous picture at the RAND Corporation in 1956, I think, of what RAND thought a human computer, a personal computer interface would look like in the year 2000, okay? And the thing to concentrate on is the steering wheel. Okay? Isn't that just great? Uh, that man, I don't know who the man is. He's obviously very good at whatever he did in 1954. But, I mean, it's just an extraordinary idea, the steering wheel. I mean, it just shows you that interfaces haven't gone the way that people thought. That's 55 years ago now. And now, of course, interfaces are these and these. That's we, in case you wonder what he's holding in his hand and jumping about. Okay? That's what computer interface means. And that's what we've been trying to situate companions in rather than in the steering wheel world. Um, why talk about, why have I mentioned interfaces right away? Because companions, whatever they are, and this is now I'm giving you the basic spiel of the project, will be computer interfaces. Interfaces to the internet, essentially, um, I'll, for reasons I'll say in a moment. It's meant to be a language-based, it's a lot of the people in it are NLP people in the companions project. Many of them are in what's now thought of as AI and emotion. The, that group has in fact taken over and pushed the NL people out. There's been a sort of development in the project, but that's politics which you don't want to know. Um, but the, the, the embodied conversational agent emotion people have got the upper hand, whereas when I started the project, the NLP people had the upper hand. But hey, that's politics. Um, I, I, I see companions still as a language-based, chatty, reassuring but informed, who won't be like robots at all, okay? That's very important. So there's our project logo. That's the thing you have to always show in an EU project to show what a lot of fine universities and companies there are in your project. Okay, so what is the Companions Project before I get down to nitty gritty? The four-year project started in 2006. Uh, we've got about $15 million to 
project for it. It was a well-funded project, it still is. Uh, 14 partner sites, two in the States, and the University of Washington and the University of Albany. Um, and its, its overall heading is multimodal interfaces. Uh, so it wasn't just supposed to be an NLP project. It was supposed to involve vision, um, haptic interfaces, and so on. Uh, the idea, and I'm going to talk now about the senior companion, which is the, we did several demonstrators in the first two years, which are on the website. This is the one I was personally most interested in. Uh, the, for reasons you won't find it hard to work out. Um, so the, the EU, they, this is how you get money out of the EU. Keep saying things like, the EU will have more and more old people who find technological life hard to handle, who will have access to funds. They won't be badly off, probably. And the senior companion I, companion I saw, not as a robot, but as something that could sit beside you on a sofa and talk to you. It doesn't have a screen. It doesn't need to have a screen. It can talk to the TV or the wherever the internet interfaces that you have. Something that talks to you, light, easy to carry, possibly warm. Possibly warm. That might be nice for old people. Like a warm, warm, cozy, furry thing. F a furry handbag is how I thought of it and described it. The main thing is it would chat to you and would be with you for a long time. Um, it, you can here list all the kinds of fantasy things you'd like it to do. What you're actually going to see the illustration of is it talking to old people about their photographs and reminiscing about their lives. Um, I was spurred to this by the knowledge of the being told that in old people's homes, uh, old people in the end of their lives spend all their time rustling through old sepia photographs, trying to remember when they got married, which spouse that was as opposed to that one. You know, I mean, just, <laughs> what, what's that child called? You know, uh, getting mixed up. And um, so, I mean, they don't have to have dementia, but people clearly do like rehearsing their memories in old age. Um, and of course, the point behind it being that people of the age of some of you are going to have millions of pictures, millions of images by the time you're old, and just controlling this digital life, as we all know, is going to be tricky. It could also tell you the plots of DP TV programs, emergency help, you have to say things like that, phone, phone the ambulance. I, I was more interested in the fact that it, it could phone a I would like it to phone a restaurant and make a reservation without me having to actually do it. Um, we set this up in Oxford, but uh, the restaurants weren't terribly cooperative. <laughs> we, thought we, ought, we thought we ought to warn them that this would be coming from a computer, and would they mind, and if, it, if we said that name, would they not really take the reservation, but just reply so we could get a bit of data, but they didn't find that as funny as we did, so that, that hasn't happened. That's my wife's drawing of how she thought the uh, senior companion would be, this sort of furry, pet-like thing, sitting beside you on the sofa, looking at a screen. So, intelligent and sociable companions, more than a furry handbag, uh, representing you, possibly the owner as your agent, be with you for, for a long period, something you might be learned to trust, but trust is a tricky one, trust, trust is a Berkman Institute word, um, but much more important, having access to your memories in perhaps a stronger way than you do. I mean, I can see already how you can lose the grip on your own photographs. So knowing what's in your photographs, knowing what the relationships are that those photographs indicate, knowing where you've been when that the photographs tell you, and generally listening to you and trying to extract something life relevant from what you say. Um, so in some sense, de put it this way, deep in a sort of slightly military terms, debriefing an elderly user about their memories and their lives. And of course, as you know, there are a series of parallel projects that have been going on for a long time. Um, My Life Bits started at Microsoft. In Britain, there's been a big funding project called Memories for Life, uh, trying to see how much space it would take to store everything that an individual in 80 years could see, hear, eat, medical records, uh, listen to, you know, the people who have those wearable cameras called sense cams. The idea of a, a man in Lancaster called Dix did a quick calculation on the back of an envelope five years ago, and he said he thought it could all be done in 28 terabytes. Now, I wasn't sure when he said that whether to be surprised it was so big or so small. It doesn't sound all that big. I mean, it, you know, it won't be much bigger than a, you know, soup cube very soon. I mean, it doesn't sound a lot. Actually. It's quite clear that we can already, without the data, have a grip on the idea of the memories of our whole life. Um, will people want these things? This is a thing I've got interested in recently with a different project in Oxford with a, a learning companion using Wizard of Oz techniques to talk to older people about whether they would, you know, Wizard of Oz where you think you're talking to a computer but you're not. Uh, since the machines aren't good enough yet, it's better to get some social data that way. Um, older people who've had little access to the internet and want to know how to search better. And one of the things that surprised me in that project, that's not the companion's project, that's a separate learning companions thing at Oxford. One of the surprising things is um, how well disposed they've been towards it. I thought they'd be pretty negative. These are not computer literate people. But once they saw they could talk to it and it could talk back to them, it was a computer they believed it wasn't in fact, it was a person, um, they, they showed all what you might call the Reeves and Nass um, 
symptoms, all the symptoms of identification with the system, wanting almost to help the learning companion help them, being very positive. And, of course, lots of data supports that. I mean, Tamagotchi, we remember, you know, quite intelligent people rushed home to feed an idiot thing that, with a tiny screen that couldn't even talk. Um, people just do do that kind of thing. They, they, they seem to like these things. Um, we also know stuff. People with pets live longer. Uh, more, more research shows reminiscing helps prolong lives. Yeah, yeah, it seems... Maybe we're pushing at an open door. People won't find these things that disagreeable. Maybe more intelligent, more able, more intellectual people will find them slightly disgusting. But it's quite clear across the population as a whole. I've, I've become quite optimistic about this. Uh, this is a... Uh, sorry if you've seen this before. I took this to a BBC website some time ago. It's a Japanese woman called Akino. And this is a very first generation, five years ago, um, Japanese rag... It's a rag doll thing down in the right bottom corner called Primo Puel. Not, I think, a genius title, but you know, Japanese technology is often in advance of their, their um, technology naming habits. So they sometimes get them wrong. Um, Primo Puel, meh. but this was great fun, and the story is terrific. Um, Primo Puel doesn't understand anything. It just jabbers in rather bad Japanese. It just jabbers all the time. And what was nice was her reaction to it. Um, the woman loved it. She was elderly. She loved it. Um, she, said, she said two things I remember in the interview. She said, A, she said... Um, I like to hear it even when it's just chatting away in another room. <sighs> Gosh, I mean, that's like leaving the TV on, I suppose. Nothing about that. But the other, the most stunning thing she said I thought was wonderful was, she said, it gave her more comfort than her husband's shrine. Yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. So, um, for a time, we ex we've experimented with various interfaces. I won't bore you with the details. This is a thing that's sold enormously in France. We, all European projects must have at least one French company. Uh, a French company that sells... Has anybody seen the Baz tag? Oh, you should look at it's N A B A Z T A G, which is you don't know this. It's the Armenian for rabbit. It's run. The company is run by a, the company Nabastag is run by an Armenian Frenchman. They've sold a million of these. Uh, they cost about ninety bucks. It's a rabbit whose ears wave, and it's it's an inter a web interface. Um, we didn't. We took it and customized it. It the Nabastag you buy for ninety bucks doesn't have speech recognition. It just is output. It needs a power source, and it just outputs. It outputs from the web by, by short-range radio. And uh, basically, the idea is that two people who are separated by long distances buy them, uh, sort of his and hers, as it were. And uh, uh, you can type what it's to say into the internet, and then a few seconds later, your loved one, wherever they are, will hear the rabbit say it. And it if you're sad, it looks blue. If you're happy, it looks pink. It waves its ears. It, it's, the rabbit is meant to show sort of elementary sort of emotional feelings. I don't know what I'm going on about this. We just use it as an interface. We put speech recognition into it. And one of the sub-projects, not in Companions, not mine, used the Baz tag as the interface, which is why it's here. It's quite fun for about 10 minutes. Anyway, it's, it, it certainly made one, at least one Frenchman very rich. And the idea here was that you, you'd see the Companion would be the same personality. That's a dubious issue, whether you always want the same personality in your Companion. Do you want to choose the Companion's personality? Do you want different personalities at different times if you're bored? Big issues. But I'm just showing you by this picture that we, we're trying to show that the idea of the same avatar icon personality would be there on whatever platform you happen to use, from TV to mobile to... Um, and indeed, if you look at the website, you'll see the demo there of a, uh, of a companion on a mobile. Not totally successful, but something. So the Companions Project is really about language. It's run by NLP people. And the relationships and emotion expressed through language. I mention that because if those of you who know the developments in um, computers and emotion know that um, quite a f the leading theories of emotion in computers aren't really language-based. They're based on multidimensional models of emotional features, very sophisticated models. Um, we've rather taken the hope that view that which I happen to believe is the case myself, but, I, but then as I'm an NLP person, I would say this, wouldn't I? That much of what we think about as emotion is actually expressed through language and heard through language. Subtle differences in what people say to you um, induce quite different emotional reactions in you. We all know that. Uh, but nonetheless, the view I'm just hinting out now, although I shan't describe it here, that emo emotion is in computers can be to a large degree natural language based, isn't the central view. It's, but it means it's not about robots. Of course, cuts us off for lo lots of slides. David Levy, who I mentioned before, funded our Love and a Competition adventure 10 years ago, has recently become rather famous with a book called Love and Sex and Robots. This has been... The Lobner Prize made him about $2,000. This book has made him a great deal of money and got him onto all the major breakfast chat shows. Um, and, but, of course... <laughs> 
This is about, this isn't entirely about robots, and it's not entirely about sex. He's really interested in emotion and affection and relationships. The interesting part of that book is that he's predicting and producing some evidence that people will begin to have serious emotional and affective relations with artificial things within a fairly short time. He may well be right. Um, that's a parallel thing to what we're doing. I think he may be right. I think that's what we're aiming for too. But he, of course, gets wonderful slides in there. I mean, because he's got robots in and we're not robots. So he's trawled the old movie databases and found the most extraordinary pictures. It's worth buying the book for the old movie slides. Okay. As I say, Levy's emphasis was really on emotional relationships rather than sex. So, I repeat, companions will be internet agents. We'll get to some NLP in a few seconds. Um, not robots, a new kind of agent as an answer to what I still think of as a very passive web. It, I mean, I know you guys know this, but I'm not sure the public out there has quite got it, how passive the internet is. You've got to find what you're looking for. Um, by and large, it doesn't come up and hit you, uh, nor should it, I mean, nor would we want it to necessarily. But, I mean, in a sense, the core paradigm we know is still search. You've got to find what you want. I think a lot of people find search very hard. I mean, I assume everybody in this room is a rather fairly somewhat sophisticated searcher, but we don't know, do we? Because searching is one of those very private things, like you know how you clean your teeth, that you don't discuss very much with other people. I mean, sort of private activity. I mean, we, I, I, I asked around him, the man who was head of our scientific counseling companions is uh, Ricardo Baisayatis, who you may know his name in information retrieval. He's the head of Yahoo Research Europe. And I asked him about a year ago, I said, is there any good research results on how good people are at searching, and whether they get better? Or do they just have a go at it? Do they just, they know they should refine their searches. Sure, we all know that. You know if you're not sophisticated, you can use booleans. But is there any actual evidence or any research results on how good people are at search uh, and, and what real techniques they have for improving their own search? Or do they just live whatever they can do? And he said, no, he didn't know of any. And I suspect this is the case. Um, this is actually slightly alarming. Um, if there are sophisticated techniques for improving your search, and there are, we know that all kinds of positive feedback techniques. One of the things I would like to see in a companion that was your interface to the internet was its ability to talk to you, find out what you really want, and then use much greater expertise to find it than you have or are capable of getting. I think there's something in there. Okay, so this is, we're getting a little bit of nitty gritty now for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, the, the, the Sheffield group, I say there's 14 partners in the Companions Project. The Sheffield group, which I was running, became the focus for um, Senior Companion. Um, it had a number of avatars. You won't know who that wrinkled old person up is on the right. He's a famous British comedian. We thought that might be quite fun. It was quite fun for the British audience, but as soon as you showed that demo on a, any kind of international uh, audience, they said, who's that funny old guy up there? So, I mean, you know, being a famous old comedian in one place doesn't help you in others. The, the girl down the bottom left was much more successful on the whole. Um, uh, so the senior companion, what is it? What does it do? It, and you'll see this on the web if you go to the demos, and I'll show you the website in a moment, although you can find it. You can just type companions into the web. Um, I think the escort sex agencies still come up top with uh, companions, as you might expect, but I think we're now second, so uh, it's, it's, not all, it's not all bad news. Um, I, and we didn't have to fiddle the, uh, fiddle the uh, web, web statistics either. So, it reminisces about photos. Its aim, if it has one, and we haven't fulfilled this, is to build some kind of life narrative. If it knew you long enough, it could know enough about your life to, as it were, create a timeline or some kind of prose narrative linking your photographs and your documents together where you were when, that you were in Pisa in 73 and you didn't go back to Pisa again until 77 or something. Uh, it's, it's got speech, your, well, you won't see on this. It, it's got off-the-shelf speech, but it works pretty well in this environment. Um, and it uses web services. That's an important technical point I want to make. Oh, these are just photos. The senior companion is about photos. I should say that nearly all these girls are my daughters. You're not allowed to put up pictures of other people's daughters on the whole these days. Okay. So, a life narrative through photographs, your life events, marriages, who married who, when, birthdays, where, when, journeys and travels, special memories. There's going to be system modules. The system modules aren't very striking. Almost any NLP dialogue system has modules like this. As Jerry Hobbs once famously said, um, virtually every information extraction system has exactly the same modules. The details are just in the, in the, in the, in the extra 2%. Um, there's not, uh, nothing stunning there. Um, an interface, there's one version. 
it, it has access to your um, immediately and has access to your web, Facebook, or mentions of you on Flickr. It doesn't try to start from scratch with you, okay? That'd be silly. Um, it can go and find out photos of you on the web from your web albums and knows because they're tagged already. I mean, anything that's tagged is helpful. It helps tell it who your friends are, what their names are, which photographs have you in, and so on. So, in other words, there's a lot of stuff on the web now to prime a system like this. You don't need to start with the first elementary photograph, obviously. Lots of avatars, all programmed in Crazy Talk. Um, uh, I say Ken Dodd was the, um, was the comedian. My favorite one, which you'll see if you see the movie, on our website is the dog with wi a wig. Don't ask why a dog with a wig. Uh, it's a strange looking dog with wide apart eyes, wearing a wig and a high squeaky voice. It's, for most people, that's their favorite avatar in the system, but that tells you can't predict what. So it's got face identification software. Um, it uses Dragon, naturally speaking, which we've tuned up um, for these kinds of topics, as it were. It works pretty well. Um, the we didn't do any research on speech in English in the project, okay? Um, we thought we might when we designed the project, but it turned out to be that Dragon, naturally speaking, worked perfectly well and gave us, gave us a success rate at such a level that where it failed, we could get over it by other measures, by detecting misunderstandings and so on, asking people to repeat things. But you can't run an EU project these days only with the English language, for obvious reasons. There are about 22 languages, major languages in the EU these days. We had Czech partners, and they have done uh, a separate Czech companion um, with their own speech research and have done rather well. I mean, I think they may actually win the race in the end because the people controlling English demos have messed about, changed their views since I gave up on the project of, uh, I think, that crazy stuff. But the Czechs have shown complete consistency and gone straight forward with um, using the original structures we plan to have and Czech speech recognition. And I think in the end, we may end up with a better Czech companion than an English companion. Um, the only trouble with that is very few people will be able to see that, but that's, again, bad luck, isn't it? I mean, you know, there will be translations, I assume. Uh, we're using kinds of standard things. None of these are very distinctive. Anybody doing a dialogue project will be doing things like this. I'll try and point out in a moment what I think are the two or three more distinctive features of what we're doing. We are Using underneath uh, a system called Gate, which you may or may not have heard of, it's, uh, it's had an awful lot of downloads, several thousand downloads. It's one of the main, it's about the main project my group in Sheffield have produced. It's a general architecture for text engineering. Um, I started it, but it was been taken over for many years by a colleague called Hamish Cunningham. It's freely downloadable from the web. It does quite a lot of basic text processing for you. It's in about its third implementation now, and it's relatively efficient. There's still a slight learning curve, learning how to do it, but it works pretty well, and we use it. Um, the, one of the main distinctive features of this system is not to do parsing, but to try and do language understanding by information extraction. One could take quite different views on this. Um, there's no doubt that parsers have come a long way uh, in the last 20 years. There's also no doubt that the criteria for successful parsing have changed. The goalposts have been moved so that, in some sense, although it looks a lot better, part of that is because of not demanding whole sentence parsing from parsers in competitions. Um, I since I, can, I had a group in Sheffield that a lot of its effort had gone into information extraction, it, wouldn't be, it wasn't very surprising that I wanted to see uh, whether the techniques we had for information extraction, basically for prose done in DARPA competitions, would also work on dialogue. Um, I think they work pretty well, but um, you know, some people have a very strong view. My colleagues at Oxford don't take this view. Steve Fullman takes the view that a serious parser is essential. We do have a parser in there, but it's still fundamentally an information extraction system trying to get out the essence of what you're do saying, because what people say, as you know, is on the whole not to speak in well-formed sentences. It's not any ums and ahs and anacoluthons, whatever they're called, incomplete sentences. It is quite difficult to run a serious parser over dialogue. Everybody in the parsing business knows that. Um, there's other ways out than ours. There's ways that say, let's parse the bits and grab those, the well-formed bits. You know, people often use real noun phrases. Or to try and use, which is not totally disparate, Information extraction has to rest on some kind of structure grabbing as well. But it's a slightly different philosophy, so that's a distinctive feature. Another distinctive feature underneath it is to try to link it as much as possible with what you might loosely call semantic web technology, um, you know, that belongs very much here in Cambridge, but down the road. Um, that's to say, RDF representations, Yena rules for a limited amount of reasoning, and knowledge bases, ontologies, all this sort of general semantic web representation. Um, the reason for that being largely not not through deep belief in its efficacy, it's clearly very weak, but because it's tractable, although weak, 
And because you can get, as you probably all know as well as I do, an awful lot of the web knowledge you want off the web in that format, Wikipedia in RDF, Facebook in RDF. That's the way things come at you now, even if you choose to strengthen them later. This is very important. This unbounded, that's an in inverted commas, to me that's a crucial point, and it may only reflect the fact that I go back a long way in AI. I mean, one of the great criticisms of AI throughout its history has been its narrowness, its limitations, and the fact that an AI system only represents what it is you told it. So if you wanted to know about cities where you've been in your travels, okay, you told it about Pisa and Rome and Palermo, but, it, but if you say to it Peking or Delhi, it's no idea what you're talking about. I mean, how would it? You told it about five cities. Please talk about these five cities, okay? Now, of course, the nice thing about Wikipedia is that Wikipedia, in some sense, knows about now about all cities. Wikipedia now knows about Florida towns with 5,000 people. You know, I mean, you, you can't catch it out very easily. Um, so that's the nice bit. That what we wanted was a, a breaking through what I think of this paradox of AI that you could talk about any place the photograph was about, and you could go to Wikipedia and find out where it was, and then come back and, uh, and say something from the dialogue manager, or however you want to talk about it, that showed that you knew what they were talking about, okay? If you talked, if you talked about uh, Edinburgh, you might come back with, did you see the castle when you were there? I mean, just, it's a trick, of course. It's a Lobnerish trick. It's a trick to try and show that the system knows what you're talking about, rather than going on as if it's no idea where Edinburgh is. So all this stuff, I mean, I don't need to lecture you on this, you know about this. These are all the kinds of um, stuff that underlie um, basic semantic web style reasoning. Um, weak, but adequate for things like family relationships, people in places, people's travel. It's worked out for us pretty well. Um, but don't forget, while the companion's talking to you about your pictures and going through them, it's building an ontology of your family, your friends, who you know, when you were where, who you're married to, and so on. And of course, simple simple reasoning. If, it, if, if this is your daughter and that's your daughter, then it knows they're sisters and so on. This is not very difficult in the semantic web world. Um, semantic specification, each, the, it has to, of course, an ontology of objects in there. Um, the, the, the th sorry, I said that already. The third feature that, I mean, I've got quite a few slides on this, but I don't think I want to prolong it too long because um, you either buy this kind of dialogue. DAM means dialogue and action manager. Um, the core of any dialogue system is, in some sense, the dialogue manager. It's the hardest part. Speech has become relatively, relatively straightforward. Language generation is not straightforward, but I don't think it's a gigantic intellectual problem. Um, extracting content is a problem, but it's quite clear that with a range of techniques from syntax parsing to knowledge-based, i.e., you can get stuff out. There's a whole range of techniques that people have described in NLP over the years and computational linguistics for uh, pulling a dialogue back from the brink if it goes wrong. Trying to have a guess at where to go back to if, you've no idea, if it's got no idea what's going on. And that indicates why the dialogue manager is the core of the whole thing. And it's really, I think, where the action is now in dialogue. It's what the people who I described earlier as coming from the speech community are trying to learn from scratch without making assumptions about it. It's what people like the Trindy and the Information State Update people are trying to capture with a relatively straightforward finite state model. Um, we didn't, I will say I, let me be honest, it's my fault I wrote the proposal. I don't believe that's right. I think a more complex dialogue manager remains needed for all kinds of reasons, um, particularly for things like um, a very well-known phenomenon, especially around here, Barbara Grosch pioneered it in her thesis, the ability to go back to places in the dialogue where you were before, the ability to suspend topics and go back, Okay, um, the ability to be interrupted and have some idea what you were talking about before you were interrupted. These are quite, and above all, the, and this isn't indicated by the particular structure we chose, the ability to have some idea where you are and what you're talking about and what you're up to. I mean, I know this sounds obvious, um, but, the, uh, but you probably know yourself from maybe being you know, slightly happy at a party or something. One can lose track of what one's talking about. I'm often in conversations increasingly so, well, I'm not quite sure what we're talking about. And how do we get to this point? I mean, where do we go from here? What on earth are we going to say now? God, I'm bored by this person. What are we going to talk about? Um, these are the kind of, as it were, problems that the dialogue manager has in computational form. So let me just tell you what architecture we opted for. We went back to something, well, not went back. I put a structure like this into a different project about eight years ago. It's been used by other people. Um, it's been used in the WITAS project in Stanford. 
Uh, it was abandoned there in favor of a different model. I think they abandoned it too soon. Um, I, but again, since I still believe in this, it's a single pop push stack which stacks complex network objects. The network objects, uh, which are fundamentally ATNs by a different name, correspond to all kinds of different things. They correspond to topics, and they have subparts. There are networks that correspond to talking about individuals, some talking about individual photographs, some talking about individual places. In other words, the network objects that are stacked can correspond to any form of object, or indeed to a dialogue recovery strategy, or indeed to a plan. Now, the plan isn't so striking because um, there's an obvious isomorphism between ATNs and plans. That's been known for about 40 years. Okay? Uh, the, the more difficult thing is to persuade oneself, which I have more or less, that the kind of computational facility that an ATN network gives you is appropriate for discussing particular events or relationships or places. Now, in a way, it's a trivial question because an ATN, ATN has uh, Turing power. It can do anything. That's no help. Okay, that's the Turing machine tarpit, as Carl Hewitt used to call it. I mean, the question is, can you constrain that reasoning in such a way as to make it work and be useful? This means, for example, we can go through an ATN, we're calling them uh, something else here, uh, suspend the computation, push it down the stack, and then when it emerges again on the top of the stack, to go back to where we were. You don't really, of course, have to store, store whole networks on the stack. You just store the last node you're at. I mean, that's an obvious computational point. So, I th the argument here is that ATNs, in some sense, are old but vigorous. Um, of course, as you know, they were developed by Woods, not very far from here, for doing syntax. They weren't derived for doing dialogue. The original and possibly stupid point here is to try and see if the power that an ATN gives is, can be applied to mapping dialogue about a topic or a place or a person as it could for parsing a, uh, a noun phrase or, or a prepositional phrase. Now, they are quite different tasks. I mean, the great advantage of ATNs when they were originally derived, and some hint of those have survived in all kinds of upgrades through Martin Kay and all kinds of people in computational syntax. The advantage was the recursion and the ability to store things in registers so that you knew globally what was going on. Well, for dialogue managers, the global registers, of course, are ideal. It's the global registers through which the knowledge base is affected. When something happens, the, 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 the register on that arc tells the global knowledge base, oh, it's his mother, stick that in, it's his mother. Okay, or by his or John's mother. Um, you don't need the power of recursion the same way in processing dialogue as you do for processing syntax. Dialogue is not nested in the way syntax is. Uh, that's obvious. We could discuss that at length. Uh, let me push on a bit. Uh, they're easy to write and understand as data structures. This is an important point. People can write these as script-like structures. They are script-like. I mean, sorry, I, I say script, but I... One hesitates to use that word because if you say the word script, everyone says, oh, you're doing shank. No, we're not doing shank. We're doing something with a much more controlled computational structure. Shank wasn't completely wrong with scripts. Or I think with scripts is you have to have lots and lots and lots of them. They have to handle very different kinds of things, not just objects but relationships and plans. He adapted them to plans, of course, famously, but also uh, recovery mechanisms. In fact, anything that can be stacked and is the object of your current attention at the top of the stack. And, of course, not being a very computational person, Shank, for all his great virtues, didn't have a very computational view of how it should be carried out. He thought computational methods were for RAs and graduate students. I mean, he didn't interest himself in that. The clear point here is there is a stack of things. You're dealing with the top one. And that also, of course, leads to problems as well as benefits. Um, there's our technical troubles. I won't go into them in detail now because I want to get to the end. Um, there are technical troubles with trying to use a single stack of networks, uh, particularly how you recover and go back to a net, a stacked net, which you know is some way, well, you don't know, the system doesn't know, but is in fact some way down the, the stack. How can you go down to the third one down without just jettisoning all that's above it? Well, at the moment, it does just jettison everything that's above it when it's called. And that actually may not be a psychologically very good thing to do. There are ways of getting around this, but if you get around them that way, you tend to lose the purity and clarity of the stack. But I won't go into this now. It could possibly be a long question. These are what they sort of look like. The dialogue action forms, we call them, so as not to use the word ATN and frighten the horses. Um, there's just little indications of how things go up and down the stack. I don't think you probably, you guys need that. There's a discussion here, if we had lots of time, of um, do you want to augment the stack being able, by being able to find things in a way that slightly cheats? That's a disputed question I don't yet know. It doesn't at the moment have an augmented stack. It has a straightforward stack. I still think the stack may have to be augmented in some way. Uh, lots of 
Okay, I've given you a demo, no demo. I've told you the three features the system has that I think are of some interest and some limited sense of originality. There are lots and lots of research problems there. Um, I just want to get on at the end and just say something about some more general issues with companions. But by and large, this system has been developed as I said so as to be a platform for machine learning so that we could, the things we already learn in it are that the, the dialogue acts are learnt. A student of mine called Nick Webb, now at the University of Alden Albany, did a very good dialogue act learner. So dialogue acts like, you know, promises, int intention labels, essentially, intention tags. That's been learnt. We've tried to actually learn to segment using a form of the tiling mechanisms of Marty Hurst to learn to segment the dialogue corpora we developed so as to try and learn individual DAFs, ATNs, from the segments we found. We have some results, but that has not been totally successful. I still believe these DAFs can be learned. I think it's probably though a matter for massive data, which in the area we're working in, we simply don't have. We made some data, quite a bit, but it wasn't enough. Um, there's a whole load of research challenges here if you're interested in dialogue. Um, my assumption was, when we started out, how naive I was three years ago, that if the dialogue manager was strong enough, the, the, the stack and net dialogue manager, it would compensate for failures in recognition, both at the acoustic level, because there are some, and of course at the information extraction level, that you've got the wrong stuff out. Um, you know, it's, it's the old story. When we talk to people, we don't need to hear very precisely what they're saying, because we know pretty well what they're talking about. Occasionally we get it wrong. Uh, you get it wrong between close dialects like English and American where we can understand, misunderstand each other both at the acoustic and the syntactic and idiomatic level. But by and large, you've got ways around that. You just, the dialogue manager knows what's happening. You're trying to ask this hotel if they'll serve breakfast in your room and that's what you're going to get. But again, let me get slow here. This is not meant to be simply a task-oriented project. That's the whole point. At the moment, the the photograph application I've talked about is a funny mixture of task-driven, which means it asks you about who the people are in the photographs and wants you to tell them and make sure you answer consistently from last time because you go through the same photos again, old people in homes get them wrong next time. Okay, They forget where they were. Um, but also, it's a reminiscence system. It's very important that. I didn't want this to be just one more task-oriented system. We've got lots of those. They're the things that let you buy train tickets online with acoustic methods and so on. Um, so this is quite important. I mean, what can be learned on a platform like this or any other platform of this type and generation remains to be seen. It, it won't survive unless it can be learned. I think there could be deployed systems that are, as there are now, which are entirely either handcrafted or based on existing learning. But to be interesting, a system like this will have to have some ongoing method of learning. I think I've said much of this. Well, you want this to fuse with question answering. We've done a lot of question answering work in... Sheffield as well. One thing you've got to be able to do with your companions, be able to ask it questions. Um, you know, it's not just questions about when Abraham Lincoln was born, the kind that Wikipedia will answer right away, but more interesting questions. Um, you know, what was my first wife's name again? Uh, you know, uh, what are my children called? Um, uh, and more interesting questions than that, you know. Um, have, I, have I got an appointment with the doctors tomorrow? I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. And emotion. I've skipped over emotion and said that the emotion gang were in some sense a separate gang in this project, but that's not strictly true. Um, there has been some fusion with emotion. The emotion speech people at Sheffield, again, have done some very good work on uh, detecting emotion in the voice, uh, trying to put emotion, a little company in Italy called Loquendo, who do our generation for us, wonderful voices, and they've been trying to put some of this emotion back into the voice. Um, you can tackle com dialogue and emotion at many different levels. The simple level is the, sort of the acoustic level and the immediate detection of when someone's angry, someone's happy, that stuff. I was interested in some deeper, and of course, as I said, there's the NLP aspect of emotion, like if someone talks to you like that, they're probably being rude. That's a linguistic matter. I'm interested in that too. But I think it's a deeper issue than both these, which is whether emotion, however conceived, however represented in the system, should in some sense guide the system in a more global way. Not just, you're cross with me, I'll be cross with you. No, 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 you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. Low-level stuff, should be possible. But in some general sense, like, I really am sad today and I want to talk about X. I want to look at my weddings again. Oh, you know, people wake up like that. Um, mm. So that in, a, in some sense, the dialogue manager itself should have some access to emotion representation. As if emotion was something not at the dialogue manager level of stacking nets, but in some more, think of it as some more global 
constraint that would move across a very big space of networks to know where to go, not just in the topic sense, but in a sense of emotional feeling of certain photographs had. Certain photographs will induce sadness or happiness and so on. This is very difficult. I think there are more interesting questions there than just immediate emotions seen as another tagging issue. Almost everything we do in NLP these days reduces to a tagging issue. I think there's something more interesting to be said there. I've said this already, using web services, it, c it can already do that to some extent, you'll see in the demo, break out of stored knowledge and dialogue. Uh, there's the project, um, there's the project uh, website, uh, and you can find it by typing in companions, you can look at the movies. Um, the movies were actually made by a computational linguist from MIT. You, he's too far gone from MIT now for you to know him, but there was a well-known computational linguist once called Tom Wachtel, who used to run the Canon Labs, when Canon did NLP. Uh, he's given up all that and has become a filmmaker. So we actually had the films on the website are made by someone who used to be an NLP person, which is, I think, fairly unique. There aren't many people who occupy those two roles. Okay, let me just close in 10 minutes with um, just a couple of things not to do with the NLP at all. I've said what I can say on that without going into too much detail. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting socially and legally and personally relevant questions about companions that I'd like to explore at some stage, or at least you know, explore with other people more likely, because I'm not a social scientist. Um, I said this already. Um, I think I've shown this slide, in fact. Um, but it, the, the bottom button emphasizes that we can, if we think about the possibilities of companions, it's of companions which in some sense know all about us, either because they've got it from other websites, or because we've told them a lot over 20 years looking at our photos, or because they've got access to all our medical records. Um, one thing I'm discussing with colleagues in London in the um, computational health business, as, and there are many such things here. I mean, Sergei Nirenberg at um, University of Maryland is doing a thing called the Virtual Patient. I think many, that has many sites in the States. Uh, the Virtual Patient is usually thought of as a computational model of all my medical functions, all my you know, readouts, all my history, all my data. But of course, there's another aspect to a, a Virtual Patient, if you were the patient, where you'd want it to be a digit, digital me, is a phrase there of a colleague of mine, um, it'd be you in a different sense. I mean, you'd like to be able to ask, what's happening to me now? What are they going to do to me tomorrow? And what are my chances? This, of course, is in some sense a cognitive thing. Uh, Nuremberg at Maryland has been investigating this as well. I can see a whole range of ways in which a non-robotic companion could take on a whole range of incarnations, and health will be just one of them. The one I started with, as I said before, is that um, it's your life on the web. I, when I, it's an absurd jump from the little bit I've shown you of something that can talk to you for a while about photos to all my life on the web. But I'm just thinking ahead now, what it would be like if it's you know, 70 years of photographs on the web, 70 years of documents, 70 years of conversation, and what it might have learned from me. Um, all kinds of things come up immediately, many of which you've thought about around here, I'm sure. Um, not just the storage issue and the access issue. I mean, if you've got, if you've got 80 years of pictures, the problem is how, do you, how you find the ones you want and that's more than a tagging issue. It's more than an emotion issue. It's, we don't quite know what it is. Part of it, I think, is arranging your life in some structure. One of the things I originally had in mind, and of course time is running out on the project, is that the output, I wouldn't say evaluation, because yes, we've, def we've designed evaluation procedures being run by Albany. They're perfectly okay in their way. I mean evaluation at a higher level. I hope that we would go far enough that we could come out with a narrative life at the end my life, not my life, somebody's life, as a narrative. The photographs arrange in a timeline, if you like. Date them all. Date them sometimes by inference, not just by timestamp from Google. Your coherent life, which of course resolve, require resolving all kinds of stuff, like, you know, you can't be in two places at once. Um, you appear to be, you know, on January the 1st, 1974, you appear to be both in Pisa and in New York. How can this be? I mean, there'll be more questions to be asked there, because we know your timeline isn't like that. Um, but the other sorts of things that arise immediately, and you're very familiar with these, I know, is lots of people are going to want to get hold of your life if you do this. You've got, I'm sure you're all good liberal people like me, you're going to want to keep it under your control. It's not just your medical records and your photos, but everything you can, and not let other people have it. But they're going to want it. Companies are going to want it. The government's certainly going to want it. We know this. Um, the, the interesting questions will be how can this be controlled, although sometimes you want somebody else to get it. I mean, a lot of the European health projects that involve lots of languages and NLP are all based on the premise that if you're a Scots person who has a car accident in Greece, you want the Greek doctors to be able to find your medical records immediately. And that's why you want to have 
a translation and a knowledge base facility so the Greek doctor can immediately see in Greek, uh, you know, what your, what, your, what your medical history in Scotland was. I mean, yes, yes, you do want that, but of course you also don't want that. I mean, you can see both sides of that. It's a, it's a tricky one. There's no simple answer. But it's going to come up with things like this. The control of this material, the companion is a biographer, and will you trust it? Who owns you? Will you own digital me? We all know this too. It'll affect all your own mental processes. Our mental processes are already being affected, aren't they? I don't know about your children. Uh, my children don't bother to remember phone numbers anymore. I know most of the phone numbers of my life. My kids don't because they don't need to. The phone knows the numbers, for God's sake. Why would anybody bother to remember them? Um, will, anybody, will you remember who anybody is? Why do you need to? I mean, the Japanese have already got some fairly advanced and very interesting things where it reads your, you have a little camera that reads the visiting card, the, the conference card on the other person's lapel and tells you very quietly who they are. Um, very useful. I could really use one of these increasingly. Do you remember, you remember the word nomenclator? It's a great word. It's a word from Roman history. Uh, when the emperor, the Roman emperor went about, there was a slave behind him called the nomenclator and this was the guy who whispered in the emperor's ear who he was talking to, so he didn't have to bother. And this, uh, this slave, apparently, was the most important slave in Rome. He also controlled the party invitations. I mean, you get the idea. I mean, and I think politicians have people like this now. This is clearly up for, uh, up for automation, isn't it? And I say the Japanese are there already. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you've... Uh, that's an actual quote that was in a magazine I read weekly in Britain, an economist called Geoffrey Bernard. Geoffrey Bernard's thinking of writing his autobiography. If anyone can tell him what he was doing between 1960 and 1985, will they please write to him? And <laughs> he was a drunk. He was in the bar most of the time, so he needed this. But it was a wonderful advert, and uh, I still quote it. Um, companions will talk to each other behind your back. And why shouldn't they? I mean, if, you, if old people will have companions, old people will be in old people's homes, they'll be shy. They won't like talking to other 80-year-olds very much. Um, maybe their that person's companion, your companion, would chat to each other and fix up a little lunch together. I mean, why not? I mean, companions will make dates for you at any age, perhaps. Old people may need it more. Maybe not. Um, there, there are already applications. A friend of mine, I don't know if he's succeeded yet, but a friend of mine has tried to patent a mobile phone application where, um, it's where the child has companions on the phone which talk to other children's companions. And what are they doing? They're gossiping, and they're, but more importantly, and why he's trying to sell the idea, because they're trying to fix up that the other child buys presents for this child, of course. I mean, there has to be, as you say, a revenue stream. But I mean, yes, I think kids, our kids' mobile phones will be talking to each other very soon, I, and you may or may not like that. Um, it's surely going to happen. Clear dangers. Um, if Levy's right, and very soon we'll have affectionate relations with computer companions, I'm not emphasizing this part, I'm just remembering his book, <laughs> then companions will be applying for trade on the internet personals before long as well. I mean, you know, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, so indeed, companions are already infiltrating computer chat rooms. I'm told, I mean, I've not I haven't been to enough chat rooms to find out it's true. It's an obvious place. Any dialogue capacity, there's a general theorem, isn't there, that any computer technology any deployed computer technology moves towards sex with a big revenue. I mean, dialogue programs will move there too. They won't be stoppable. I mean, uh, you know, um, and so on. Uh, companions will know about you, all about you. That can be basically a good thing, and I've just said this already. Whose companion are they? Um, you won't want to be too rigid about this. I mean, it's no just, just saying, look, uh, it's all my information. It's mine. Um, because your accountant already knows a great deal about you. Your bank knows a great deal about you. Your doctor knows a lot. Lots of people know lots about you. The, the, you know, the, credit, the credit companies know all about you. I mean, already so many people know much about us. It's not as if the companion will introduce anything fundamentally different. It'll just be a node of access all in one place. Um, something you might want to, um, well, you'll want constraints on what your companion can say to other people like you'd expect your, your lawyer and your accountant to show all kinds of professional discretion and they're bound by codes of practice. You'll want companions bound by codes of practice. No one has any idea yet what those will be, but they will, they will come into being. Um, I mentioned this already. Look at this last slide. But look, we're technologists. Let's look on the bright side. Um, hey, uh, the, as the sort of aspects of a, of, a, of a virtual patient, what's happening to me and why, these could be very positive. Long before the 97 Lobner competition that... Um, Stuart, refer, uh, Stuart referred to Lovner, but long before that date when I got interested in this, actually my first practical interest in this was back in the late 90s, was talking to health people about why they didn't have a dialogue program that did hospital counselling. I mean, 
you know, the notion of informed consent is crucial, especially in America, more so than Europe. Um, a great deal of professional energy is wasted, wasted, used, on, on counsel. You must be told what the effect of this procedure will be. Before you have an amniocentesis, you must be told the risks of having it and the risks of not having it. This could clearly be automated if it was a very sympathetic um, uh, nurse companion to do it. That wouldn't be a companion in my sense. A companion in my sense knows all about you. I'm talking now of something that just was designed there to extract, extract, to see if you would consent in an informed way to what was about to be done to you. This, I think, is a great deal of possibility there. That's not a computer companion, but there's going to be a great deal of that. And it's going to be a great interest. I mean, think of it. It's a reverse Turing test. Okay, it's not the Turing test where you decide if that's a, com a machine or has human attributes. This is a system where the computer decides if you have the attributes, right? Have you consented? It opens up a whole other world of reverse relationships, what Marxists would once have called dialectical, between people and machines. It's not all go going to be one way. Okay? I mean, another aspect of why it won't be all one way, I think the companion of the sort I've described if it came into being would be a very good identity substitute. Okay, we know there are irises. There's fingerprints, fallible. There's DNA, meh. Can't extract that in a second long test. Irises, meh, so-so. That may be what it takes. But, I, I mean, many people have said already, not original here, that the mobile phone is becoming the identity card. And as the mobile phone moves more and more towards pay payments, as it is in many parts of the world, their mobile phones are essentially micropayment systems now. Um, that, in a sense, makes the, the mobile phone an identity card, and the banks are cashing on this by working out whether your mobile phone's in the same place you are. I mean, we know that. So I mean, the companion would just be a stronger version of this. The compa the, another reverse sort of Turing test, the companion might be the best placed entity to say that you were who you said you were, not simply because it knows your voice, and knows all about your early life, and knows what you had for breakfast the day before yesterday. So if you'll tell it that you had such and such for breakfast the day before yesterday, it says, yeah, I think this is him. Okay? So I, mean, I can see a world where your, your mobile companion vouches that you're you. Okay? I'm not trying to sell this hard. I've not, I've not only thought about this, and I, it's nowhere near implementation. But I, I'm just trying to get across the idea that if anything to ex were to exist like a companion, it would have interesting features not just beyond chatting, entertaining, informing, or accessing the web for you, or making appointments for you. It becomes an alternative person to you with, as I say, what I would call reverse Turing effects. And of course, finally, of course, it, uh, it, becomes, it becomes your afterlife, doesn't it? And when you're gone, it's still there. And then you have to think very carefully who gets it, and what you want it to be like after you're gone, and whether you want your relatives to go on talking to it after you've gone. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of mileage in that, I think. Anyway, thank you very much. To vote for? But yeah, that's a very nice point. I mean, I should have put that on the list in the last slide. Thank you. I mean, indeed, I mean, uh, again, these are always sort of entertaining possibilities. But I think that's a real one. I do think that's a real one. Um, if it understood enough about you and what you believed in, it might remind you that you shouldn't be voting for blogs. You should be voting for Smith. And I mean, yeah, I, I, I have a, of course, constitutionally, we can't imagine that. But I, I don't know. You, you probably don't know this here, but I mean, among the sort of fun and games of the IRA over many years, um, one, of, one of the arguments, the main IRA man who's now very respectable in the Lord Irish government is called Jerry Adams. And one of Jerry Adams' great lines has always been, I won't try and do the accent until I can, um, one of his lines always been, I'm not here just representing Irishmen, I'm here representing all dead Irishmen. Okay? And I mean, that's, that's a powerful argument. If he, I mean, I'm not debating the truth of it, but it's a very powerful argument. He sees himself as a representative, a a, a cast of votes for the dead. So, I mean, I, I can see, you know, <laughs> when we're gone, the companion, you know, wants to go on voting, you know, it just wants, I'm, I'm not being serious, but I mean, I, lots of fun possibilities. After all, it knows who you'd vote for, because it knows your views and listens to the arguments. No, this is not completely serious, I know. Sorry? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Although, 
you know, if it chats to you on the long winter evenings on the sofa long enough, I don't think it's obvious that you will be able to keep it back. You know, it's like one of those, you know, one of those famous sort of spy novel debriefings where they just keep asking you the same question again and again for months and months. And eventually you tell them. Eventually you tell them just because you're bored and you let slip. And uh, I'm afraid it would be quite difficult to keep secrets. Yeah. What you would have to ensure is that when you knew what it knew, that it, it was constrained by you from telling anyone else. I think it would be harder to stop telling it. Because you could work things out anyway. It would see where you went. Yeah. Well, and the kind of projects I was talking about, we've actually, uh, we, we had to do evaluation studies because you can't do it without now. And um, the guys at Albany, Nick Webb and Tomek Strakowski, I don't know if you know of them, or well, Strakowski has been around a long time, um, they've adapted a different, slightly different twist on evaluation that David Traum set up. You know David Traum in, uh, in California? He tried to create um, a more interesting kinds of corpora to evaluate against. So, I mean, I think the key word is appropriateness. Because it's really, you know, maybe you know a lot about it, it's probably more than me, but dialogue evaluation taken in the way that DARPA projects are evaluated, like how long do turns take? Um, whether the goal is achieved, how long do turns take, what is the stickiness of the site to find in terms of how long you stay with it. These are okay, but they're very, very simple-minded. They, they don't capture what we mean by a good conversationalist. And Traum was certainly making a move towards that with appropriateness, and the guys in Albany who are our evaluators, basically, they've tried to adapt the Traum method, yeah. The kind of stuff I've been talking about the last 15 minutes, though, is beyond the evaluation, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's just fantasy. Well, I mean, exactly. I mean, we've got, okay. again, you may know a lot about this and I don't. I'm not a sociolinguist or a sociologist or any kind of discourse theorist. I mean, there's a lot of, you probably know, in linguistics, there's a whole lot of people who consider themselves discourse theorists. And they have a professional handle on this. They think they know what makes good conversation and bad, although I'm a bit suspicious about it. I don't know what you do. But um, so th if, they, if they could do it, they'd be the people you need. The answer is we don't have those people on board. And I suppose we're using our own intuitions on what constitutes continuous conversation and the repair of misunderstandings, just like most computational linguists do. But again, that's very amateurish, I would admit. I mean, if you know many computer scientists, you'll know that they're not the kind of people you would trust to tell you what conversation was. You know, they're not, they're not a skilled bunch. Well, uh, sorry. Yeah, I th thanks for the fee. <laughs> we did actually, yeah. If you mean that, yes. Um, in the machine. No, no, no. Well, not pushed it forward, but you see, I mean, they've taken it off the web now. But all the Lobner transcripts are available. And we did take a s s couple of years ago a selection of the more successful ones. And of course, you've got the, the journalists there who are people as well. You can tell which are which. We, we, don't, we didn't, didn't want the machine ones because, of course, this again is a problem in machine learning, isn't it? You don't want to learn from the bad data. It's like you don't want to learn English grammar from foreign writers of English. I mean, you know, you want to have the best data you can or you simply build in the error. So we took what seemed to be humans on the Lubna website when it was there and tried to learn from that because that at least was the same kind of um, world we were in. It, it got some data, but the trouble is, and again, as Stu will ask, say this if, if we talk afterwards. I mean, there's something highly artificial about the Lobner situation. You're trying to fool people, and that's what's wrong with the whole Lobner Turing test world, is that we aren't normally talking to people trying to fool them that we're a person. Well, we're trying to fool them we're a nice person, but not a person. And that <coughs> messes the whole thing up. But yeah, so we, we've taken data from where we could. And there is successful data, conversation data on the web, yes. Um, not just Lobner, but there's not a lot of it that's easy to get at. You wouldn't want to take chat rooms, for example. I think chat rooms are basic. You might think chat rooms are an infinitely extensible data source, but they're not because most chat rooms are kind of psychopathic. You know, I mean, they're, just, they're not conversation. I don't know your views, but that's my view. You want to hit him because you, you asked when and then come back to you? Yeah. 
Yeah. Of course, the, the, the demonstrator isn't yet good enough for that. Um, that's one of the reasons we shifted over to Wizard of Oz techniques to try and see um, what people's staying power with systems of the general sort are. The trouble is, of course, the wizard is an awful lot better than our system. So we haven't got a system yet that you want to talk to for more than half an hour. And that, I'm afraid, is the truth. Um, there's, since most deployed dialogue systems are task-based, sell you a train ticket in five minutes, you don't you know, no issue arises there. Task completion is the right criterion. There, there's very little, except back, I'm afraid to say it again, back to Parry. Parry at Stanford in the 70s, because Ken Colby, who now, now dead, who did Parry, every morning he used to get the transcripts. From, you know, Parry was available on the very early ARPANET when there were only about five sites. And people across the states could, and he was delighted when he came in the morning in Stanford. I was in the next door office, so I remember all this. He was delighted when he came in in the morning in Stanford and found that some girl at MIT had been talking to Parry for an hour. And, and I'm talking 1972, and he took this as huge proof of success. And if she'd revealed something slightly interesting and personal, he was even happier because, you know, oh, he thought this was, this was clear proof that the whole thing was going really well. So the answer is no, nothing bad and good. Yeah, sorry. Good point. I know. I mean, what you might call in the technical universe belief revision. I mean, radical belief revision. I mean, this is going to be very hard, isn't it? Because if it's learnt that you're an X and you start saying why like things, it's going to sort of want to contradict you and try and pull you back, isn't it, from what I've said? I mean, like, like saying, no, you weren't in Pisa that year you were in Rome. No, you don't believe this. You believe that. I mean, obviously, it's got to be possible to reconvince it, but I agree. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one with spouses nearest and dearest, isn't it? I mean, how do you convince people you've, you're not the man you were? It's um, very, very tricky. Yeah, it's... Um, I, think <laughs> I can see a lot of problems there. Yep. I don't think I, I don't know how things go at Berkman. Still, tell me. But it, is, a, is it a general roundtable chat, or is it? A, do I have to give another talk? Roundtable, roundtable chat. No, I'm not giving another talk. No.